Hello, my name is Emily Lomas. I'm the Terrestrial Invasive Fauna Specialist with the Ministry of Water, Land, and Resource Stewardship. I am also the EDRR Coordinator for Terrestrial Invasive Fauna. I'm Amadis Vieira, and I'm the Aquatic Invasive Fauna Specialist in the Ministry of Water, Land, and Resource Stewardship. Hello, I'm Tracy Hippelizer. Provincial Entomologist with the British Columbia Ministry of Agriculture and Food. I'm based in Abbotsford. Hi, my name is Becky Brown. I'm an invasive plant specialist with the BC Ministry of Forest Invasive Plant Program and Provincial Coordinator for the EDRR Response for Terrestrial and Aquatic Invasive Plants. The purpose of this webinar is to improve awareness of the overall Invasive Species Early Detection Rapid Response Program in BC, eradication candidate species present in each region, and where to report suspected new occurrences. Greater awareness will lead to new invasive species being detected early, increasing our ability to contain and eradicate them before they have an opportunity to establish and cause significant harm. This webinar can be customized to the individual viewer by selecting the timestamp for the region or species of interest. See the webinar synopsis for relevant timestamps. Early Detection Rapid Response, also referred to as EDRR, is a management process that prioritizes the early detection and rapid response to new invasive species incursions in a defined area in order to prevent the establishment, spread, and long-term impacts and cost. The BC EDRR process is described in the Invasive Species Early Detection and Rapid Response Plan for British Columbia, a concise guide that is structured around six steps as seen in the slide. Each step describes the process for dealing with the introduction of new invasive species into BC and the roles and responsibilities of those involved. These steps describe the operational components of a successful program for discovering, identifying, evaluating risk, treating, and monitoring the introduction and treatment of a new invasive species quickly and effectively. From a broader perspective, the BC EDRR plan also describes program management and administration and reporting and outreach as important elements of the overall program function. Each step is described in more detail in the body of the plan. Invasive species that are designated as candidates for provincial eradication are defined as terrestrial and aquatic species known to be invasive and damaging and not known to occur in British Columbia or present in limited amounts. Invasive species are identified as candidates for eradication or EDRR species through the completion of risk assessments. These assessments generate scores assigned to probability of entry, probability of establishment, probability of spread, consequences, and uncertainties. These scores are then assessed against eradication feasibility to determine whether a species is a suitable candidate for provincial eradication. Risk scored species will have management directives issued by the BC Inter-Ministry Invasive Species Working Group, EDRR Advisory Subcommittee, that will inform operational and strategic activities. The BC Invasive Species Climate Modeling Project began in 2021 in response to the need to automate invasive species provincial range forecasting and a shift in global and provincial climate categorizations. This modeling generates species range maps for BC for the timescales of current, 30-year, 50-year, and 90-year projections. This work is important because focusing our efforts and limited resources in a smart way will buy our ecosystems and industries the important time needed to adapt and develop resilience to change and a greater ability to recover from large-scale natural disasters like floods and wildfires. Provincial government invasive species managers are using these models to focus on risk assessments and species prioritization decision-making, active species-specific surveillance in high-risk areas, targeted engagement, and education with high-risk sectors or commodity groups to limit introduction pathways and vectors, and resource allocation. Eradication feasibility refers to the existence and associated cost of treatment methods that will achieve eradication of a target species and are available and accessible in BC. 
Access to effective methods of eradication may require the establishment of provincial or federal product registrations and permits to allow for the prescribed use. The requirement for these additional authorizations will often take time and resources and is factored into the overall risk assessment and management expectations. Invasive BC is our new Provincial Invasive Species Database and Mapping Application, launched in Spring 2023. It is replacing the former Invasive Alien Plant Program Database and Mapping Application, otherwise known as IAP. This new system has many useful functions, including the ability to enter positive and negative observations, treatment and monitoring data, all which is important for measuring changes in species populations and treatment efficacy over time. The system also has spatial analysis tools, a batch uploader function for large quantities of data, and a mobile app and web-based platform. The mobile app will be launched in spring 2024 and will have the ability to function on and offline, which is important when working in remote areas. Invasus BC is currently accepting only terrestrial and aquatic plant data. The terrestrial and aquatic animal functions will be coming soon. All invasive plant EDRR operational data is entered into Invasus BC and may be accessed by the public. If you suspect that you found a new invasive species to the province, please report it. Reports made directly to the provincial government invasive species programs will be actioned quickly and reduce the overall response time, which will hopefully prevent further spread of the occurrence. Each EDRR report is disseminated to the appropriate taxa coordinator for verification. If a report is confirmed to be a new occurrence, it will trigger the early detection rapid response process which will result in containment of the occurrence until control efforts can be initiated. There are several reporting options, which can be found at the web link. If you want to report mussels, please use the Conservation Officer Services hotline. If you have no internet service and want to make a report, please call Front Counter BC and they will forward you to the relevant taxonomic specialist. There are two EDRR species in BC that span multiple regions. So at the provincial scale, we have feral pigs and European spongy moth. Feral pigs are defined under the Wildlife Act as any pig of the genus Sus that is not in captivity or is not otherwise under a person's control. They are also listed under the designation and exemption regulation under the Wildlife Act in Schedule C, meaning that it is open season for these animals. However, reporting of any harvest is mandatory. Feral pigs are also considered livestock at large under the Livestock Act. Here is a map showing all locations of feral pigs since the 1990s. Remember that these reports include any loose pig outside of a fence. So many of these include pigs that have recently escaped from their farms and are returned. However, we do have two main areas of concern in the province. One is in the center in the interior in the Caribou region, and the second is the Peace region due to its proximity to Alberta and the known feral pig populations in that province. Here are the number of feral pig reports over the years. As you can see, since the 90s, feral pig reporting from the public has been relatively low. However, in the past few years, this has increased to about 10 to 12 reports per year. This does not necessarily mean that pigs, feral pig numbers are increasing. However, it does mean that people are more aware of the risks associated with feral pigs and reporting has increased. The province's response to feral pigs is on a case-by-case -case basis. It often involves a lot of collaboration with the pig owners, other groups and stakeholders, and across ministries. Often it will require recapture, whether that's the owner recapturing their pigs or trapping uh, setups. It will also involve a lot of education to pig owners about the proper ways to fence pigs. Many cases can be complex due to animal welfare issues and human safety issues. The European spongy moth was formerly referred to as the gypsy moth and Lamantria moth. It was introduced from Europe into the northeastern US 
in the 1860s. Since then, moths and larvae have also escaped. They established and slowly spread across eastern U.S. The females are flightless and lay 500 to 1,000 eggs. Females will lay eggs on just about anything. The larvae emerge in the spring and feed on a broad range of non-conifer hosts, of which there are over 300. There's a long history of introductions of spongy moths into BC, primarily associated with the transport of infested goods. We have so far prevented establishment via intensive eradication efforts. So why do we care? In established areas, this non-native invasive species can cause significant impacts when it has outbreaks, including environmental and ecological impacts, health impacts, and economic impacts as well. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency continues to be the lead for detection due to the threat of spongy moth introduction. There is annual trapping across BC and delimitation trapping in areas of concern. So to keep BC spongy moth free, we have the CFIA leading detection. We also have spongy moth technical advisory committee that assesses annual results and provides recommendations for new detections and new trapping and eradication to establishing populations. Ministry of Forests plans and implements eradication programs. To keep BC spongy moth free, eradication is completed by ground and aerial spraying. It usually involves three treatments with BTK about seven to 10 days apart in the April, May, or June months. Regardless of the size, these programs require a lot of work and require a lot of resources. Many areas have been included in the eradication program, including the interior, lower mainland, mid Vancouver Island, and greater Victoria area. If you have any questions about spongy moth or spongy moth treatments, you can visit the website at www.gov.bc.ca slash spongy moth dash news. You can phone the information moth line or contact the forest health officer with Ministry of Forest, Babita Baines at babita.baines at gov.bc.ca. The West Coast region includes Vancouver Island, Central Coast, and Haida Gwaii. There are four EDRR invasive terrestrial animal species in this region, Nutria, Argentine ant, Asian needle ant, and the northern giant hornet. Nutria are semi-aquatic rodents native to South America. They have several impacts, including agricultural damage, erosion of wetlands and stream banks, infrastructure damage, and they can spread diseases and pathogens. There were nutria fur farms in BC from the 1930s to 1960s. Many nutria were released over this time, and there were sightings into the 90s, including on Salt Spring Island and in the Lower Mainland. However, there has not been any confirmed occurrences in many years. It's thought that cold winters have kept this animal in check. However, climate modeling shows us that there's an increased probability of nutria occurring in BC, including in the middle of the province and northern BC. Due to climate change and the fact that nutria are now established just across the border in Whatcom County in Washington, we've been organizing surveys every few years. Surveys have been done on Salt Spring Island and in the Lower Mainland. In 2022, we focused solely on the Lower Mainland due to the devastating flooding of the Nutsack River. The surveys involved hair snare platforms and remote sensing cameras and were completed in 2017, 2022, and most recently at the end of 2023 and early 2024. Several species were detected in these surveys such as rats, raccoons, squirrels, and beavers, but no nutria were found in any surveys. 
The Argentine ant has been confirmed in two locations in Victoria, once in 2015 and again in 2018. Their pathways that they may be introduced into BC include trade and movement of goods, such as in the nursery trade. The threats they pose to BC include the fact that they could eliminate native ant species in their area, and they can produce agricultural crop damage due to how they tend honeydew producing insects. The Asian needle ant has not been found to be present in BC. It has been observed in Bellingham, Washington in 2011, which was a single record and thought to be eradicated. Their pathways into the province could include trade, movement of goods, including garden material, potted plants, and wood waste. This species would outcompete native species and be pests to ag agricultural workers. Asian needle ants don't invade homes and are generally not aggressive, and they are not nest defenders. However, they do sting and can result in anaphylactic shock to those who may be allergic. The northern giant hornet is native to Asia. In BC, it was discovered in Nanaimo and in the Fraser Valley. However, there have not been any new detections since 2020. It was also discovered in Washington State, and there have not been any new detections there since 2022. However, entomologists do keep looking for this animal and are keeping up to date with the latest science. WSDA entomologists have traveled to Korea to conduct hornet research, which will help them inform survey areas in their state and in BC and the response activities associated with them. As with the introduction of many invasive species, there's no real way to tell how these were introduced to the Pacific Northwest. Some possibilities include international container ships, purchases shipped into the US or travelers visiting the US or returning from another country. A related species, the yellow-legged hornet, was detected in August 2023 in Savannah, Georgia. So we should always be on the lookout for Vespa species. The South Coast region includes Metro Vancouver, the Fraser Valley, the Sunshine Coast, and Squamish. In this region, we have four EDRR species, Nutria, Asian Needle Ant, Northern Giant Hornet, and the Japanese Beetle. Nutria are semi-aquatic rodents native to South America. Their impacts include agricultural damage, erosion of wetlands and stream banks, damage to infrastructure, and they can also spread diseases and pathogens. There were Nutria fur farms in BC from the 1930s to the 1960s, and over this time, many Nutria were released or escaped. There were sightings of Nutria in the wild in the 90s, including on Salt Spring Island and the Lower Mainland. However, there have not been any confirmed occurrences in many years. It is thought that the cold winters kept their population in check. However, climate modeling shows increased probability of nutria occurring in BC, including in the middle of the province and in northern BC. Due to climate change and the fact that nutria are now established just across the border in Whatcom County in Washington, we've been organizing surveys every few years. Surveys were done in 2017, 2022, and 2024 on Salt Spring Island and in the Lower Mainland. Hair snare platforms and bait stations and remote sensing cameras were used. In 2022, we focused solely on the Lower Mainland due to the devastating flooding of the Nooksack River. Many species were detected, including rats, raccoons, squirrels, beavers, but no nutria were found. The Asian needle ant is not yet present in BC. It was observed in Bellingham, Washington in 2011, a single record that is thought now to be eradicated. The pathways of movement into the province will include trade and movement of goods, for example, garden material, potted plants, and wood waste. The species would outcompete native species and be pests to agricultural workers. Asian needle ants don't invade homes 
They are not generally aggressive and they do not defend their nests. However, they do sting and can result in anaphylactic shock to those who are allergic. The northern giant hornet is native to Asia. In BC, it was discovered in the Naimo and the Fraser Valley. However, there have not been any new detections since 2020. It was also discovered in Washington State, and there have not been any detections there since 2022. However, surveys are ongoing and entomologists are keeping up to date with the latest science to help inform our survey areas and our response activities. As with the introduction of many invasive species, there is no real way to tell how these were introduced to the Pacific Northwest. Some possibilities include international container ships and things shipped into the US or Canada and travelers visiting the US or returning from another country. A related species, the yellow-legged hornet, was detected in August 2023 in Savannah, Georgia. So we should always be on the lookout for any Vespa species. Okay, Japanese beetle, Popilia japonica. This is a federally and provincially regulated pest, which threatens fruit crops, nursery, landscape, and the natural environment. On the right-hand side, you can see the adult feeding on foliage. It can feed on over 300 different plants. Below, you can see the larva, which feeds on fibrous roots, primarily grass or turf roots, and it's in the soil about 10 months of the year through late summer, fall, and winter. Eradication efforts are underway in Metro Vancouver. In addition to survey, movement controls, education, and outreach to, public, to the public and industry. Progr the program began in 2018 and continues in 2024. This is a partnership with federal, provincial, the cities, industry, including the landscape and nursery industry and other uh, horticulture industries, as well as non-government organizations. We've had success so far the beetle numbers and infested areas continue to decline. More information can be found at the Ministry of Agriculture and Food website under Japanese beetle. For invasive aquatic animals, the West Coast region doesn't have any EDRR species confirmed to be present. Let's keep it this way by not releasing any pets into the wild and sharing the don't let it loose message. Remember that the province only manages freshwater invasive species and marine invasive species such as the European green crab are managed by DFO. So please submit any reports of marine species directly to them. The South Coast region has three EDRR invasive aquatic animals confirmed to be present. Western mosquito fish, white cloud mountain minnow, and oriental weather loach. The western mosquito fish is prohibited in BC under the Wildlife Act. It has so far been listed in the prevent category, but has now been found in BC at two locations, at Grafton Lake on Bowen Island and at Fish Trap Creek in Abbotsford. Even though mosquito fish are considered sensitive to colder water temperatures, there have been documentations of the species surviving and spreading throughout Nebraska and Missouri, where annual mean temperatures are similar to regions of southern BC. In terms of their impacts, they are known to be aggressive toward other fish species, sometimes killing or injuring them. They have also been noted to impact zooplankton, insects, and crustacean populations through the predation and competition. The white cloud mountain minnow is also prohibited in BC under the Wildlife Act. It is provincially listed in the prevent category, and even though there have been no known observations of this species in natural BC water bodies, there have been two recent instances of pet stores selling them in the lower mainland. Conservation officers were able to respond and seize the fish on both instances. If released into the wild, white cloud mountain minnows could potentially establish and spread into regions of BC. This would be possible due to their low temperature tolerance and wide ranging diet. For example, they can survive water temperatures as low as 5 degrees, and they feed on plankton, aquatic invertebrates, and the larvae of aquatic insects, which could impact the dynamics of BC ecosystems if they were to become established. They spawn several times per year, which gives them the potential to spread fast. They also 
are potential carriers of diseases and parasites that could impact native fish. The oriental weather loach is also prohibited in BC under the Wildlife Act. It is common in the pet trade and widespread in the wild as it was confirmed in multiple locations and is no longer EDRR. You can find more information on the species alert sheet, which is posted on our website. The Thompson Okanagan region doesn't have any EDRR invasive aquatic animals confirmed to be present. Let's keep it this way by not releasing any pets into the wild and sharing the don't let it loose message. The Kootenai Boundary region has one EDRR invasive aquatic animal confirmed to be present, the Boral crayfish, previously known as Northern crayfish. In the past, the Viral crayfish has been listed in the prevent category. There have been historical reports in southeastern BC in the Kootenai region, and it was confirmed this past summer in Lillian and Mui Lakes. This is not unexpected due to the historical reports and its presence in surrounding jurisdictions. The negative impacts of this species on the ecosystem include competition, predation, biodiversity, and food web structure. A risk assessment for these species is currently also being prepared. The Caribou region doesn't have any EDRR invasive aquatic animals confirmed to be present. Let's keep it this way by not releasing any pets into the wild and sharing the don't let it loose message. The Omineka region has one EDRR invasive aquatic animal confirmed to be present, the rosy red minnow, also known as rosy red fathead minnow. Rosy red minnows are fractional spawners, which means they spawn in batches throughout the spawning season rather than within a short period of time. Each female can have 16 to 26 spawning events per year, which is equivalent to annual fecundity rates per female of 6,800 to 10,600 eggs. Rosy red minnows can tolerate high turbidity, low oxygen levels, and wide temperature ranges. For example, as low as 2 degrees and as high as 33 degrees. The rosy red minnow is listed as provincial EDRR category, and its presence in BC has been known at a few locations. They were originally found at Bittner Creek in Prince George in 2018. In October 2019, six ponds were drained, a fish salvage was conducted to preserve native species, and minnows were removed via electrofishing and dip net. Unfortunately, the physical removal effort was not successful, as we received a report last June that shows that not only they are still present in Bittner Creek, but they have expanded their range and are now closer to the Fraser River. These fish are breeding and can compete with native species such as the brassy minnow. The stream flows into a tributary to the Fraser River which, with native species like white sturgeon and salmon, which are ecologically and economically important. The Northeast region doesn't have any EDRR invasive aquatic animals confirmed to be present. Let's keep it this way by not releasing any pets into the wild and sharing the don't let it loose message. The Skeena region doesn't have any EDRR invasive aquatic animals confirmed to be present. Let's keep it this way by not releasing any pets into the wild and sharing the don't let it loose message. Remember that the province only manages freshwater invasive species and marine invasive species such as the European green crab are managed by DFO. So please submit any reports of marine species directly to them. This is the update for terrestrial and aquatic invasive plants that are candidates for provincial eradication and being managed under the early detection rapid response process. I'll be providing an update by region to improve regional specific awareness in the hopes that we can increase the detection and reports of new species or occurrences across the province and achieve containment and eradication before these new occurrences have an opportunity to become established and spread. The West Coast region of BC currently has nine confirmed EDRR species present. It's important to note that these occurrences are all located on Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands and that as far as we know, Haida Gwaii and the Central Coast are clean, at least of provincial eradication invasive plants. In addition to these nine confirmed EDRR species, there are three species occurrences that still require verification or are not reported but likely to occur due to historic presence and distribution pathways. These latter species are marked in the list on the slide here with a question mark. 
There are two species of Spartina present in the West Coast region, Spartina densiflora and Spartina patens. Spartina densiflora is known to occur in six areas, including Bain Sound from Royston consistently down to Union Bay to Deep Bay north of Bowser, Goose Spit in Comox, Denman Island, Hornby Island, Sandy Island, and the Seal Islets. From 2022 to 2023, treatments resulted in overall reduced abundance with a total area of 0.02 hectares, that's only 200 meters squared, dispersed over 96 hectares. It really gives you a sense of just how little there is on the landscape and what a huge opportunity we have. Spartina patens, similarly, um, it's known to occur in six areas, Bain Sound, periodically from Royston to Deep Bay, Goose Spit in Comox, Courtney Estuary, Sandy Island, and the Seal Islets and Hornby Island. From 2022 to 2023, we saw a decrease of approximately 8% in the abundance of Spartina patens individuals. In 2023, 0.73 hectares were treated chemically of a total 2.6 hectares dispersed over 162 hectares. Meaningful Spartina patents treatments only began on the islands in the last couple years because mechanical methods were first trialed and found ineffective and a good deal of public education has been needed. Spartina management in BC is coordinated by Ducks Unlimited Canada through the BC Spartina Working Group, of which the province is a member and a significant funder. It includes a partnership with many local governments First Nations and other stakeholders across all of the impacted areas. The map points indicate occurrence of a single plant to larger patches. The lines on the map indicate the boundary where treatments may occur under our current pesticide use permit. The permitted treatment area is larger than the area of known infestation to allow for treatments of newly detected occurrences during the life of the treatment permit. The coastline and estuary search for these species annually varies based on reports, targeted pathways, and availability of survey crews during suitable tide windows. These Spartina species are intertidal grasses, meaning that survey and treatment timing has to be coordinated with the tides, with the extreme low tides providing our greatest window for detection and treatments. As with many emergent aquatic invasive plants, extreme low water maximizes the opportunity for detection and foot access, but hinders boat access. All of these factors must be balanced to work in these really dynamic site types, in addition to the normal um, weather being suitable and, and winds and so on. Surveys of each impacted area occur two to three times annually, and all detected Spartina occurrences are treated. Spartina densiflora is treated mechanically with manual digging, and Spartina patents is treated chemically with aquatic herbicide Habitat Aqua using targeted spot applications by hand pump backpack sprayers with applicators traveling on foot. The effects of Habitat Aqua may be visible in one to three months. However, accurate treatment efficacy is measured over a period of 12 months. The efficacy of 2023 treatments will be fully assessed at the beginning of the 2024 growing season. The invasive Spartinus pose significant risks to our coastal ecosystems, navigation, intertidal fisheries, and coastal tourism. There is a single population of slender false brome present in BC, located on the north shore of Cowichan Lake, South Vancouver Island. This population is made up of small patches and individual plants within an overall impacted area of less than eight hectares. It occurs on public and private lands and is co-managed by the Ministry of Forest and Mesa Plant Program and Mosaic Forestry. Slender false brome can thrive in open and closed canopy environments, is not pal palatable to livestock or wildlife, and poses significant threats to plant diversity, forest regeneration, and grasslands in BC. It is suspected that this first introduction came from the United States on camping equipment. Eggleaf spurge was first confirmed in British Columbia in 2022. There are currently 13 occurrences of eggleaf spurge present in the West Coast region, 11 in the Greater Victoria area, one on Salt Spring Island, one on Main Island, and one in Ladysmith. This species has a long growing season and thrives in drought conditions when many other species struggle. There is only one confirmed invasive genotype of Phragmites present in the West Coast region in the Greater Victoria area. It is contained, has been reduced to only a few stems, and is under annual management. 
There were two new clones detected in Nanaimo in 2023. They are contained and awaiting DNA confirmation as to whether they are the native or introduced Phragmites genotypes. In BC, the native and non-native Phragmites genotypes share many characteristics and ID using physical morphologic characteristics is not reliable. All Phragmites clones are confirmed to the subspecies level using DNA analysis. This confirms whether a clone is native or non-native and where it originated in North America. To date, 319 Phragmites clones have been analyzed in BC and only 19 have been confirmed as the introduced genotype and are under active EDRR management. Yellow floating heart is an aquatic invasive plant that spreads by seed, stem, and root fragments. There are three confirmed populations of yellow floating heart in the West Coast region. The populations in Parksville and Nanaimo occur in confined ponds, and the Galliano Island occurrence, which was just confirmed this year, is in an open waterway. The Nanaimo pond location was removed mechanically in 2023 because it had a concrete substrate and we were able to draw down the water and confirm that all reproductive plant parts were removed. Typically, this is not an opportunity that we have as most substrates are organic and it can be very difficult to confirm that we've mechanically removed all of the root fragments. Similarly, it is often not possible to draw down the water in a waterway and so it, it makes um, confirming that we've got, captured all of the propagules very difficult. Anyhow, in this instance, it was possible and wherever we can use non-chemical -chem methods, that is what we do. We're planning to treat the uh, private confined ponds in Parksville with aquatic herbicide Persilicor FX during the 2024 growing season. This herbicide was registered for use in Canada in May 2023 and has been used to effectively control yellow floating heart in the United States for many years. It has an excellent environmental profile and is currently the only effective method available in Canada for eradicating large, dense populations of yellow floating heart. Yellow floating heart is widely available in nurseries. We ask that people please exercise caution when buying aquatic plants and when they are bought, do not release them um, into open waterways. Portuguese broom is the least common of the broom species in North America, occurring in California, Oregon, and now four sites in British Columbia. Three of the four sites located in BC are on South Central Vancouver Island. These occurrences were first confirmed by the EDR program in 2023. The three occurrences on the island are all on highway rights of ways with one east of Port Alberni and two in the Nanaimo area. The two in the Nanaimo area were treated and are contained in 2023. Um, the one in Port Alberni, we're hoping to complete the first extent surveys and treatments in 2024. We weren't able to access the population in 2023 due to a um, large construction project. Portuguese broom is unpalatable to most livestock and wildlife. It decreases rangeland value and it can increase fire hazards. It produces copious amounts of seeds. One single shrub can produce up to 20,000 seeds. And similar to Scotch broom, it can re-sprout from cut stumps or root crowns and after fire exposure. A broom lookalike's key will be coming out this spring to assist in differentiating between the different broom species. There is one confirmed occurrence of French broom in British Columbia, located in the Greater Victoria area and one reported occurrence still to be confirmed on Pender Island. It is limited in Washington State and present in Oregon and California. A broom lookalike's key will be coming out this spring to assist in differentiating between the different broom species. Brazilian Elodia is the most commonly sold aquarium plant in the world. There are only two known occurrences of this plant present in public waterways in British Columbia one in an open lake in the Greater Victoria area. This occurrence is very challenging because it is an open waterway. It's popular for fishing and other recreation activities, and it is surrounded by residential properties around the perimeter. We're working on other smaller, more confined aquatic plant sites to develop treatment methods that will be effective in controlling this larger dense population. Dyer's woad has been reported in a private garden in the Victoria area, and we're in the process of verifying this report. This species is known to be grown privately in some gardens as a source of dye, 
but the confirmed occurrences in British Columbia remain very, very low at this point. Patterson's curse, which looks very similar to blue weed, has been reported in the Victoria area on a residential lawn. Um, we are working to verify this occurrence, although significant disturbance in the area uh, may have resulted in, in the population not persisting. This is our hope. Anyhow, we're, we are following up on it annually and monitoring to ensure that it doesn't return. Water lettuce, water hyacinth and flowering rush are distributed in nurseries, um, especially water lettuce and water hyacinth. There are currently no occurrences in public waterways in um, the West Coast area, but we do encourage people to be on the lookout for these and, and please report them. Giant reed is a federally prohibited species throughout Canada. It's regulated by the Canada Food Inspection Agency. There are currently no known active sites of giant reed present in British Columbia. However, it was previously known to be sold through a wholesale nursery, and there were several local governments that did historically use it in plantations. Um, we encourage people to please report any occurrences of this, of this plant it is a giant grass and it is it is quite obvious on the landscape and can have very significant impacts when growing adjacent to open waterways. In the West Coast region, there is currently one confirmed occurrence of clary sage in a private garden in the Victoria area and an unconfirmed occurrence of meadow clary in a private garden on Salt Spring Island. The seeds of clary and meadow sage are widely distributed for horticulture purposes in BC through both online and nursery sales. These pathways cannot be intercepted at this time. The risks of clary and meadow sage were reevaluated in February 2024. As a result, both species were removed as candidates for provincial eradication. Both species will be reevaluated in five years' time using newly generated research findings and incorporating climate modeling. As a result of the currently low risk posed by these species, management is not recommended on public lands. However, garden and nursery sectors should exercise caution in promoting drought resistant sages and ensure that only non-invasive varieties are used. These species are not currently provincial eradication candidate species. However, they are quite limited and should be controlled in the West Coast region. Shiny geranium is um, under containment in uh, the greater Victoria area and uh, particularly conservation sites are at greatest risk and so we are encouraging all impacted land occupiers to manage um, occurrences in and adjacent to conservation lands very aggressively. Blueweed is quite limited on south and central Vancouver Island and we encourage impacted land occupiers to prevent the seed production of any occurrences on their properties. Princess tree has been traded in uh, uh, the horticulture sector for some time now. Uh, it can be found from time to time growing in uh, ornamental settings. At this point, there is only one occurrence uh, confirmed of princess tree in an open public forested setting, and that site is under management. Again, these species are not candidates for provincial eradication, but are certainly of, of um, concern in the West Coast region, and we do encourage people to report new sightings. The South Coast region of BC currently has 14 confirmed EDRR invasive plant species present. In addition to these 14 confirmed EDRR species, there is one species, giant reed, that is not reported, but likely to occur due to historic presence and distribution pathways. This latter species is marked with a question mark. Brazilian Elodia is the most commonly sold aquarium plant in the world. There are only two confirmed occurrences of this species present in public waterways in British Columbia. One of those confirmed populations is in an open waterway in Richmond. It is in the monitoring phase of EDRR, having not been detected since 2020. An additional occurrence has been reported in Burnaby. However, it was not found to be present at the coordinates provided. We will continue to monitor this reported occurrence until it is either confirmed as present, a mis-ID, or having not persisted. The Richmond West Waterway occurrence provides unique opportunities for trialing different treatment methods 
because the water levels are controlled by a weir system, allowing for segments to be isolated and water levels drawn down. In the end, the most effective method for controlling Brazilian allodia at this location appears to be a combination of water drawn down during winter to expose overwintering propagules to freezing temperatures and equidash, a microsuction dredging method of removing actively growing plant parts from the water during the growing season. This approach occurred for two consecutive years, 2018 and 2019. The Richmond occurrence must remain undetected throughout the growing season for six consecutive seasons before being declared eradicated. 2023 marked the fourth year of no detections. There is one occurrence of Dyer's Woad in the UBC Botanical Garden. It has been deadheaded annually to prevent seed production and spread. It has not been present for the past three years and is in the monitoring phase of EDRR. Dyer's Woad is occasionally cultivated in private settings as a source of indigo dye. It is non-palatable to livestock and wildlife and it's allelopathic and capable of spreading aggressively across rangelands. In the South Coast region, at the time of compiling this webinar, there were two confirmed occurrences of egg leaf spurge present in a public garden in Vancouver and a private garden in Coquitlam. Both occurrences are now contained and under management. In addition, there were two reports in Delta that have now been confirmed to have not persisted. More occurrences are likely in the Lower Mainland and we encourage any reports of suspected egg leaf spurge or other invasive spurges. There are many spurges, otherwise known as euphorbias, available in nurseries, and only some are invasive. A spurge lookalikes key will be available in spring 2024. There are five occurrences of flowering rush in the South Coast region, including the largest population in the province in Hatsuk Lake near Mission. There is a confined occurrence in a pond in Mission as well, in addition to uh, single golf course ponds uh, impacted in Chilliwack, South Surrey and Whistler. Although we've not been able to trace any of these introductions to specific retailers, it is clear that the primary source of introductions is through ornamental plantings in both confined and open waterways. Our priority for the Hatsik Lake population is to prevent spread into the Fraser River, which could act as a major vector to downstream suitable habitat. The Hatsik population is contained at Lowheed Highway during the growing season by a physical containment boom. The pump station acts as an additional physical barrier and manual removals of all plant propagules in the Lower Hatsik Slough from Lowheed Highway to Fraser River is a priority annually. We're working towards treating the entire Hatsik population, but this will involve aquatic herbicide and further public education and staff resourcing is required. In the meantime, the population is contained. The golf course ponds are scheduled for treatment using aquatic herbicide Habitat Aqua in 2024. This method has been used in Whistler for several years and proven effective in controlling the flowering rush with no negative impacts to other aquatic life. Giant reed is federally prohibited uh, and regulated by the Canada Food Inspection Agency. There are currently no known active sites in British Columbia. However, new occurrences are likely due to historic sales of this species through nurse, the nursery trade. We know for certain that there were um, ornamental plantings of the species in the past. If you come across any giant grasses growing in gardens or in natural areas, please do report them. This species can be very harmful when growing in or adjacent to open waterways. Goats or seeds are federally regulated by the Canada Food Inspection Agency. There are currently seven occurrences in Metro Vancouver, six in Vancouver itself and one in Coquitlam. Goat's rue is toxic to livestock and wildlife. The most common lookalikes are the vetches, which grow in a more prostrate form and have tendrils on the leaf tips, unlike goat's rue. Please check seed certificates prior to purchasing grass and wildlife mixes and reject and report contaminated mixes to prevent the accidental introduction of goat's rue. 94% of mouse ear, present in British Columbia, is in Metro Vancouver. Mouse ear spreads by seed, rhizomes, stolons, and adventitious root buds. The most effective means of controlling mouse ear is with targeted spot applications of herbicide. No treatments occurred in Metro Vancouver from 2013 to 2022 due to public and city opposition to herbicide use. During that time, the impacted area increased from one hectare in 2013 
to greater than 50 hectares in 2022. This situation exemplifies the importance of responding rapidly to new invasive species to prevent establishment and impacts and limit the resources needed to eradicate the population. Had we been able to treat the mouse ear population consistently from the time of detection in 2013, the amount of herbicide required to control the population and the time required to achieve eradication would have been substantially reduced. The province resumed herbicide treatments in partnership with the City of Vancouver in 2023. All other mouse ear occurrences in the province of BC are aggressively managed to prevent seed production annually. In 2023, a large population of perennial pepperweed was confirmed, extent surveyed and treated in the intertidal area of Mud Bay in South Surrey. Once this population was physically delineated, two crews were mobilized in under a week to treat all occurrences using chemical or mechanical methods. The mechanical methods were used in the pesticide free zone. Um, treatment methods were focused on preventing seed production. This occurrence was first reported in the Global Biodiversity Index and iNaturalist in 2016 and 2021 respectively. Detection and identification confirmation were delayed due to inaccurate coordinates and site location descriptions. A second small historic voucher occurrence was confirmed, extent surveyed and treated in Vancouver in 2023. Both occurrences were confirmed by the botanist that made the original herbarium voucher collections. These occurrences on the South Mainland coast mark a significant provincial range expansion from the start of 2023, where it was known to have limited occurrences in the Southern Interior and East Kootenai only. All other perennial pepperweed occurrences in BC are managed aggressively to prevent seed production annually. There are seven confirmed invasive Phragmites occurrences in the Lower Mainland. One dry land site is under management in Abbotsford, one open waterway occurrence in Chilliwack, is awaiting verification as to being introduced or native. One dryland site is under management in Delta and two more are awaiting confirmation of genotype. One open waterway site in Surrey um, is also under management and an additional two are awaiting confirmation as to whether they're native or non-native. There's one dryland site in Burnaby, another one in New Westminster and two in Richmond. There are two confined waterway occurrences in Van Dusen Gardens that are awaiting confirmation as to the genotype being native or non-native. The seven occurrences to be confirmed via DNA uh, will occur in spring 2024. With Phragmites, it is important to note whether an occurrence is dry or wetted and confined or not, because this determines which treatment methods are available for use. Portuguese broom is the least common of the broom species in North America, occurring in California, Oregon, and four sites in British Columbia. One is located in North Vancouver on a hydro right of way. This is the only occurrence in the South Coast. This occurrence was first found as a herbarium voucher collection and was confirmed to have persisted in 2023. Portuguese broom is unpalatable to most livestock and it decreases rangeland value and may increase fire hazards. It can produce copious amounts of seed. A single shrub can produce up to 20,000 seeds. It may re-sprout from cut stumps or root crowns or after fire exposure. A broom lookalike's key will be coming out in spring 2024 to assist in differentiating between broom species. There are two species of Spartina present in the South Coast region, Spartina anglica and Spartina patens. Spartina anglica is known to occur in three areas, Roberts Bank, Boundary Bay, and Crescent Beach. From 2022 to 2023, treatments resulted in a decrease in the abundance of Spartina anglica by approximately 2%, with a total area of 0.05 hectares, that's only 500 meters squared, dispersed over 248 hectares. Spartina patens is known to occur in four areas, False Creek and Burrard Inlet, in Port Moody, Belcara, and the North Shore. From 2022 to 2023, we saw a decrease of approximately 41% in the abundance of Spartina patents, with a total area now of only 0.01 hectares, or 100 meters squared, dispersed across 13 hectares. These lower mainland populations are so small because they've been under aggressive management for several years longer than the ones on the islands. 
Spartina management in BC is coordinated by Ducks Unlimited Canada through the BC Spartina Working Group, of which the province is a member and significant funder. It includes partnership with many local governments, First Nations and other stakeholders. The map points indicate occurrences of a single plant to larger patches. The coastline and estuary search for these species annually varies based on reports, targeted pathways and availability of survey crews during suitable tide windows. These Spartina species are intertidal cord grasses, meaning that survey and treatment timing must be coordinated with the tides, with the extreme low tides providing our greatest window for detection and treatments. As with many emergent aquatic invasive plants, extreme low water maximizes the opportunity for detection and foot access, but can hinder boat access. All of these factors must be balanced to work in these dynamic site types. Surveys of each impacted area occur two to three times annually, and all detected Spartina occurrences are treated. Spartina anglica and patents are treated chemically with aquatic herbicide Habitat Aqua using targeted spot applications by hand pump backpack sprayers, with applicators traveling on foot. The effects of Habitat Aqua may be visible in one to three months, however, accurate treatment efficacy is measured over a period of 12 months. The efficacy of 2023 treatments will be fully assessed at the beginning of the 2024 growing season. The invasive Spartinas pose significant risks to our coastal ecosystems, navigation, intertidal fisheries, and coastal tourism. Yellow floating heart is an aquatic invasive plant that spreads by seed, stem, and root fragments. There are 10 confirmed populations of yellow floating heart in the south coast region. All occurrences are located in confined man-made ponds, except one population in Mission and one in Chilliwack. Attempts were made to manually remove the Mission population in 2023, but these efforts were ineffective due to site conditions and the plant population size. The two open waterway populations are not currently contained. We're planning to treat the private confined ponds with aquatic herbicide Persilacor FX during the 2024 growing season. This herbicide was registered for use in Canada in May 2023 and has been used to effectively control yellow floating heart in the US for many years. It has an excellent environmental profile and is currently the only effective method available in Canada for eradicating large, dense yellow floating heart populations. Yellow floating heart is widely available in nurseries. Please exercise caution when buying aquatic plants and do not release pond plants into open waterways. In the South Coast region, there is one occurrence each of water lettuce and water hyacinth in a single public pond in Surrey. Both occurrences were likely intentionally introduced by a resident as an ornamental. The occurrences were detected early, manually removed, and are being monitored, with no water lettuce detected since 2019 and no water hyacinth detected since 2020. Part of the reason the water hyacinth did not persist is likely due to unsuitability um, from the cold winter water temperatures. Progressively milder te uh, winters are expected to show a northward range expansion for water hyacinth in public waterways in the future. Future occurrences of both species are likely as they are widely distributed through multiple suppliers and these pathways cannot currently be intercepted. Please exercise caution when buying aquatic plants at nurseries and do not release them into open waterways. Also, please report any suspected occurrences of these species. In the South Coast region, there is currently one confirmed occurrence of both meadow clary and clary sage in a public garden in Metro Vancouver, in addition to one reported occurrence of meadow clary in a private garden in Metro Vancouver, still to be verified. The seeds of clary and meadow sage are widely distributed for horticulture purposes in BC through both online and nursery sales. These pathways cannot be intercepted at this time. The risk of clary and meadow sage were re-evaluated in February 2024, as a result, both species were removed as candidates for provincial eradication. Both species will be re-evaluated in five years using newly generated research findings and incorporating climate modeling. As a result of the currently low risk posed by these species, management is not recommended on public lands. However, garden and nursery sectors should exercise caution in promoting drought resistant sages and ensure that only non-invasive varieties are used. In the Thompson Okanagan region of BC, there are currently five confirmed EDRR species present, totaling 38 occurrences. In addition to these five confirmed EDRR species, there is one reported occurrence of mouse ear hawkweed, which is in the process of being verified. 
This occurrence is marked with a question mark. There are 11 black henbane occurrences in the Thompson Okanagan region, three in the central Okanagan. The one occurrence in Columbia Shuswap is in the monitoring phase, one occurrence in the north Okanagan, two in Okanagan Smilkmeen, and four in Thompson Nicola, with three out of four of these final occurrences in the monitoring phase. Jointed goat grass is regulated by the Federal Canada Food Inspection Agency. It is a major weed to winter wheat crops. There are currently 13 occurrences confirmed in the Okanagan Similkameen, with two on municipal lands in Penticton, four in Asoyus, and seven in Oliver, in the Black Sage Road area. All confirmed occurrences are contained and treated annually to prevent seed production. As previously mentioned, there is one reported occurrence of mouse ear hawkweed in Columbia Shoe Swap, which is in the process of being verified. Mouse ear reproduces by seed, rhizomes, stolons, and adventitious root buds. Please report any suspected occurrences so that we can verify and contain these occurrences quickly to prevent spread. There are eight confirmed occurrences of perennial pepperweed in Thompson Nicola, limited to the Wallachine and Monte Creek areas. All occurrences are under aggressive annual management with the goal of preventing seed production and reducing the populations towards eventual eradication. There are seven confirmed invasive Phragmites occurrences in the Thompson Okanagan region. One dryland site in the monitoring phase is located in Kamloops. One waterway near Wallachine is in the process of being confirmed. Four occurrences north of Vernon, three dry land and one confined waterway are under treatment. One confirmed open waterway at Mahoney Lake and an additional occurrence at that lake is being confirmed. Um, the confirmed site is, is under mechanical treatment. One occurrence at Vaso Lake is in the process of being confirmed. One sample, it, it, you know, it's important to note actually that one sample already sam um, uh, that's already undergone DNA analysis of Vassal Lake did come back as the native genotype, so it's quite possible the second one will be as well. There is one dryland occurrence just north of a Soyuz, surrounded by native genotypes. The confirmed invasive genotype is under active uh, annual treatment. The occurrences um, to be confirmed via DNA as native or non-native genotypes um, will be uh, will get the outcomes of, the, of that testing in spring 2024. In BC, the native and non-native genotypes share many characteristics and ID using physical morphologic characteristics is not reliable. All Phragmites clones are confirmed to the subspecies level using DNA analysis. This confirms whether a clone is native or non-native and where it originated in North America. To date, 319 Phragmites clones have been analyzed in BC and only 19 have been confirmed as the introduced genotype province-wide. All of these are under um, the EDR management. Yellow floating heart is an aquatic invasive plant that spreads by seed, stem, and root fragments. There is one confirmed population of yellow floating heart in the Thompson Okanagan region in a confined man made private pond in Penticton. We are planning to treat this occurrence during the 2024 growing season. Yellow floating heart is widely available in nurseries. Please exercise caution when buying aquatic plants and do not release pond plants into open waterways. The species featured on this slide are not currently present or reported in the Thompson Okanagan region. However, there is significant suitable habitat and there are occurrences in associated regions in the province. Future occurrences of water hyacinth and water lettuce are likely as both species are widely distributed through multiple nursery suppliers province wide. Future occurrences of flowering rush are possible. Please report any suspected occurrences. Patterson's Curse is a close lookalike with blueweed, which is well established in the region. A lookalike's key is coming out spring 2024 to help differentiate between the two species. Dyer's Woad is occasionally cultivated in private gardens as a source of indigo dye. It is not palatable to wildlife or livestock, allelopathic, and capable of spreading aggressively across rangelands. Please report all suspected EDRR invasive plant occurrences. There are currently no occurrences of these species present or reported in the Thompson Okanagan region. Occurrences outside of cultivation in BC are very limited. 
The seeds of meadow and clary sage are widely available through online and nursery vendors in BC. The risks of clary and meadow sage were re-evaluated in February 2024. As a result, both species were removed as candidates for provincial eradication. Both species will be re-evaluated in five years using newly generated research findings and incorporating climate modeling. As a result of the currently low risk posed by these species, management is not recommended on public lands. However, garden and nursery sectors should exercise caution in promoting drought resistant sages and ensure that only non-invasive varieties are used. There are currently six invasive plant candidates for provincial eradication present in the caribou region. Black henbane, flowering rush, jointed goat grass, mouser hawkweed, perennial pepperweed, and Phragmites, otherwise known as European common reed. If you suspect that you've found a provincial ADR species, please report it using the options described in slide 11. There are 13 black henbane occurrences in the Kootenai boundary region. The single occurrence in the central Kootenai near Nelson has not been detected since 2020 and is in the monitoring phase. The two occurrences in boundary near Grand Forks are under management. Of the 10 occurrences in the East Kootenays, four in Invermere and one in Fairmont are in the monitoring phase. The remainder are under active management. There is a single occurrence of flowering rush in a man-made confined pond in Nakas in the Central Kootenay. It has not been detected since 2021 and is in the monitoring phase. Flowering rush is present in the Pond Array River on the United States side of the border Targeted surveillance of the Canadian portion of the Pond Array has been occurring annually since 2012. There have been no positive detections of flowering rush to date. There are two occurrences of jointed goat grass present in the boundary. Both of those are in the Christina Lake area. This species is regulated by the Federal Canada Food Inspection Agency. The primary risk is contamination of winter wheat crops in Canada. Both occurrences are currently uh, contained and treated annually. Mouse ear hawkweed reproduces by seed, rhizomes, stolons, and adventitious root buds. There are currently seven occurrences of mouse ear hawkweed present in the Central Kootenai. All are concentrated in the Kokanee Creek Provincial Park area. All of these treatments are um, extent surveyed and managed aggressively every year to prevent seed production. There are currently four occurrences of perennial pepperweed in the East Kootenay in the Invermere and Windermere areas. One Windermere occurrence was declared eradicated following the 2023 field season after six years of no detections throughout each growing season. Those occurrences still detected are being managed aggressively each year to prevent seed production. There are currently four occurrences confirmed of European common reed, otherwise known as the in introduced or invasive version of Phragmites present in the Central Kootenay region. All of these are in the Creston area. Three of these occurrences are in the Creston Valley Wildlife Management Area in open waterways, uh, including uh, Duck Lake and Leech Lake. All occurrences are under active management annually using mechanical treatment methods at this point. There is one occurrence that was reported in uh, Kimberley in 2023. This is being verified uh, down to the genotype level through DNA analysis. Um, and that will confirm whether or not it is the native or the introduced genotype. If it is found to be the introduced, it will be added to the EDRR operational work plan for 2024 and um, control and management will begin. The species featured on this slide are not currently present or reported in the Kootenai boundary region. However, there is significant suitable habitat and there are occurrences in associated regions in the province. Water hyacinth and water lettuce. Um, there are future occurrences likely in, these, in this region um, due to the plants being widely distributed through multiple nursery suppliers. Patterson's Curse is a close lookalike with blueweed, which is well established in the region. There, again, there's, there's currently no Patterson's Curse known to be present. 
um, but we do encourage people to keep their eyes open. Dyer's woad is occasionally cultivated as a source for indigo dye. Um, it is not palatable to wildlife or livestock. It's allelopathic and it's capable of spreading aggressively across rangelands. Again, we encourage any suspected reports of these species. The seeds of meadow cl and uh, clary sage are widely available through online and nursery vendors in BC. The risks of clary and meadow sage were reevaluated in February 2024. As a result, both species were removed as candidates for provincial eradication. Both species will be reevaluated in five years using newly generated research findings and incorporating climate modeling. As a result of the currently low risk posed by these species, management is not recommended on public lands. However, garden and nursery sectors should exercise caution in promoting drought resistant sages and ensure that only non-invasive varieties are used. There are currently no occurrences of meadow or clary sage present or reported in the Kootenai Boundary region. Occurrences outside of cultivation in BC are very limited and we definitely do encourage um, any suspected occurrences to be reported. There are currently three invasive plant candidates for provincial eradication present in the caribou region, black henbane, perennial pepperweed, and flowering rush. If you suspect that you've found a provincial EDRR species, please report it using the options described in slide 11. There are 22 black henbane occurrences in the caribou region. Seven of those are in the monitoring phase, meaning that no plants were detected for at least the 2023 field season, and in some cases, several more seasons than that. Black henbane must remain undetected throughout the growing season for at least six consecutive seasons before being declared eradicated. There are currently um, 15 occurrences in Alexis Creek and seven in Williams Lake. There are two occurrences of perennial pepperweed present in the caribou region. One is located approximately 16 kilometers south of 100 mile and one in the Macaulay Lake area. Perennial pepperweed must remain undetected throughout the growing season for six consecutive seasons before being declared eradicated. That's six consecutive growing seasons before being declared eradicated. Both caribou occurrences are in the monitoring phase, having not been detected since 2020. So there is one population of flowering rush present in the caribou region, and that's uh, impacting Bushy Lake. Each red point um, seen in the map represents an occurrence of a single plant or a small patch of approximately one meter squared. Diver assisted suction dredging is suitable and effective for controlling the species and um, this particular population due to the limited dispersal and density of the infestation at the time when this approach began in 2016. So the province, the uh, Ministry of Forest Invasive Plant Program has been using diver assisted suction dredging since 2016. Um, it was initially trialed and found to be quite effective and we've continued consistently each year. Um, and we're seeing really nice reductions in uh, overall population area, density and distribution as a result. This method was trialed on other flowering rush populations in the province of BC and was found not to be um, efficient or effective, uh, just based on the different site types where it was occurring. and. Um, the variability in those populations. The seeds of meadow and clary sage are widely available through online and nursery vendors in British Columbia. The risks of clary and meadow sage were reevaluated by the province in February 2024. As a result, both species were removed as candidates for provincial eradication. Both species will be reevaluated in five years' time using newly generated research findings and incorporating climate modeling. As a result of the currently low risk posed by these species, management is not recommended on public lands. However, garden and nursery sectors should exercise caution in promoting the use of drought resistant sages and ensure that only non-invasive varieties are used. There are currently no occurrences of these two species present or reported in the caribou region. 
occurrences outside of cultivation in BC are very limited and we do encourage reports. There are currently no invasive plant candidates for provincial eradication present in the Omanica region of British Columbia. If you suspect that you've found a provincial EDRR species, please report it using the options described in slide 11. There are currently no invasive plant candidates for provincial eradication present in the northeast region of BC. If you suspect that you've found a provincial EDRR species, please report it using the options described in slide 11. We're really fortunate in that there is only one invasive plant candidate for provincial eradication present in the Stikine region in the northwest of BC, and only a single population. Unfortunately, this species is yellow floating heart, an aquatic invasive plant that once established is very difficult to control. If you suspect that you've found a provincial ADRR species, either uh, other occurrences of yellow floating heart or other species, please do report it using the options described in slide 11. The province is working in partnership with Seymour Lake Conservation Society and has been since 2015 to better understand yellow floating heart and how it is behaving in Seymour Lake. Through annual extent surveying, we've been able to map each discrete plant and patch of yellow floating heart, measuring changes in area, density, and distribution from year to year. This allows us to better understand the plant's life cycle and prioritize treatment areas. The mapping became especially helpful once we started treatments because it allowed us to see which methods were most effectively controlling the plant. At the time, when we first started, uh, research literature clearly indicated that a yellow floating heart population of this size could not likely be effect effectively controlled without the use of at least some aquatic herbicide, but there were no suitable herbicide products registered for use in Canada at that time. The two aquatic products that were registered were not known to be very effective in controlling yellow floating heart. So in 2018, the, the Seymour Lake Conservation Society requested that the province trial a variety of mechanical treatment methods as the available aquatic herbicide treatments were not desirable. So the province in partnership with the Conservation Society attempted to control and reduce the yellow floating heart population using a variety of mechanical treatment methods for four years from 2019 to 2022. Unfortunately, the population continued to increase in area and density during this time. So the province, um, namely the, the Ministry of Forest Invasive Plant Program, ceased mechanical treatments after the 2022 growing season. There are impacts of doing nothing. Of course, uh, unchecked, this population will continue to increase in density, uh, distribution and area. However, for the time being, it is contained to Seymour Lake and there are no other occurrences known in the Northwest. Um, there, were, there, are no treatments, uh, there were no treatments in 2023 or planned for 2024 as the treatments were not only failing to control the yellow floating heart, but they may have also been contributing to its spread within the lake because any type of disturbance with an aquatic plant like this that spreads through fragments um, could potentially result in, in more spread. Fortunately, a new aquatic herbicide named Procellicor FX was registered for use in Canada in May 2023. This product has been used to effectively control yellow floating heart in the US for many years and has an excellent environmental profile. Procellicor is currently the only effective method available in Canada uh, that may achieve eradication of yellow floating heart on a population um, of the size and density found in, in Seymour Lake. It's important to note that aquatic herbicide treatments in BC public waterways are very rare and they're reserved only for the control of really harmful invasive species that are limited in extent, for example, uh, candidates for provincial eradication. In order for a herbicide to be considered suitable, it needs to be effective in controlling the target species, in this case, yellow floating heart, and it needs to be safe for the environment and public health. This includes water quality, plants and animals like fish in and adjacent to the waterway. The whole idea is that we wanna help the waterway get back to a healthy state because then it will be um, better able to resist new invasive species invasions. So any treatment method used needs to leave the waterway in a better state than, than prior to the treatment. There is more information sharing and public education needed before Procellicor FX can be used to control yellow floating heart in Seymour Lake and a pesticide use permit will need to be established. 
This will include extensive engagement with First Nations and stakeholder consultation. The province does not have the staff resourcing needed to begin this engagement in 2024, but intends to do so in the near future. In the meantime, um, CPRO, the manufacturer of Procellicor FX, uh, hosted a, a Procellicor specific aquatic herbicide info session for impacted land occupiers and separately an applicator certification training program in uh, over November, December 2023. So there, there is promise for control of this population in Seymour Lake in future. And for the time being, uh, we're at a stage of uh, providing further public education. This concludes our webinar on BC Invasive Species Early Detection Rapid Response Updates for 2023. The intent was to improve awareness of the overall Invasive Species Early Detection Rapid Response Program in BC, eradication candidate species present in each region, and where to report suspected new occurrences. Our hope is that this information will improve early detection and rapid response of new species in the province. For further information or questions, please contact the EDRR coordinator for the taxa of interest. Contact info can be found in slide number two. Thank you very much for joining us.